Ah, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Denial, delusion, narcissism, and irresponsibility. Not only are they the final nail in the coffin of a dying restaurant business, but also Chef Ramsay's patience. And that's exactly what we're gonna talk about today. And what better than to start with the sixth episode of season four, when Chef Ramsay dropped by Down City in Providence, Rhode Island. Down City was the brainchild of Abby Cabral and her best buddy Rico Conforti, who went into the restaurant business together back in 2005. Since Rico had a 9-to-5 job in finance, it was Abby who was holding down the fort at the restaurant. But here's the sitch. Despite Abby's 33 years of experience in the food scene, they were struggling to fill those dining seats. Abby was scratching her head over this one since she was convinced the place was gorgeous and the food was top-notch. But her staff definitely had something to say about it. Abby has her blindfolds on because she doesn't want to admit that she's part of the problem. Being a leader means acknowledging your role in shaping your company's destiny. But Abby, well, let's just say she wasn't exactly democratic. So the decisions I make, I really don't consult Rico about them, I just do them. Most of her employees thought she was extremely bossy. And you have to hear what Josh, one of the servers, had to say about her. Abby acts like Corella DeVille. <laughs> her staff had been treated so poorly that it was impossible to give Abby any benefit of the doubt. Abby is a complete psycho fucking bitch. Yeah, so the picture is starting to come together, huh? She was notorious for her micromanagement, dodging accountability, and all in all, Abby was really giving her staff a tough time. When Chef Ramsay arrived at Down City, Abby welcomed him but dropped a bombshell, admitting that she was clueless when it came to cooking. But you know what? She was the one who created the menu without even consulting anyone at all. Nobody can say anything about the menu because it's her menu. Oh, and by the way, she also fired the head chef. And what about the brigade, you ask? Well, there was no brigade. No guidance, no rules, just vibes. Well, Down City was the very definition of a toxic work environment, and Chef Ramsay was shocked to discover that it was the same restaurant behind the dismal room service at the hotel he stayed at. Hearing that, Chef Ramsay made it a point to let Abby know about the appalling service and food quality. Both the crab cakes and tomato soup were served cold and were far from appetizing. However, Abby, stubborn as ever, rejected his criticism outright. I think you're one of those customers that I would fire immediately. Restaurant owners and not being able to take criticism? Name a more iconic duo, I tell ya. Anyway, Chef Ramsay hadn't been in the restaurant for even five minutes, and she was already acting petulant and defensive. I, I don't know where you're coming from. I really don't know where you're coming Let me from. Eat this I, food. Let I absolutely me. think you're fucking full of shit. Despite that, the famous chef ordered the three way nachos and meatloaf. The calamari was an instant disappointment, being soggy, chewy, and downright unpleasant. The nachos looked just as bad, and this is what he likened the taste to. It was like a funeral in my mouth. Meanwhile, the waiters were thrilled to have Chef Ramsay over and couldn't wait for him to join in the horror show they called work. Abby said it was a 10, <laughs> so I'm in for a treat. <laughs> yeah. After a disastrous service, Chef Ramsay gathered Abby and the staff, delivering the harsh truth that the food was shockingly bad. And in a matter of seconds, we find her morph into an all-new avatar. Bring it on. Oh, come bring on. Bring it on. What do you mean, bring it on? Did you notice how vindictive her body language was? I mean, calm down, you aren't under attack here. Not everything is personal, jeez. Sometime later, in a candid sit down with her staff, Abby defended her meatloaf as the key to their popularity. But they shocked her by confessing that they actually didn't like the dishes, but served them anyway because they had to. The staff had been reluctant to voice their opinions because they knew of Abby's tendency to react really violently. We're all at a point now where we're just like, if this is what she wants, let's just serve it out. Whew, if only she hit the brakes on her temper, things would work out just fine. But you know how Chef Ramsay is. He loves challenges. Which is why, despite feeling unwelcomed, he decided to stay back and witness the dinner service. And what did he find? Well, surprise, surprise, the kitchen was a mess. Dishes were making a U-turn back to the kitchen faster than they were reaching the customers, and what was Abby's genius solution to that problem? To stop serving the specials altogether because, you know, they were the ones that were constantly being sent back. Brilliant, right? Chef Ramsay then summoned Abby and Rico to show them the state of the fridge downstairs because, well, it left him in disbelief. What is that? Chicken carcasses. Oh my god. And what was Abby's reaction? She simply gave him the cold shoulder as if he was at her mercy. One of we was? It's like, I was talking to Rico, it has nothing to do with you. Well, yeah, at this point, I'm just as confused as Ramsay must have been. But she wasn't done yet. 
Abby, in her infinite wisdom, insisted that the refrigerator must have been spontaneously transformed into a disaster zone since the last time she checked. Wait, wait, was she accusing him of planting evidence? You're in denial! I'm not in denial! Yes, you are! I am not in yes, denial. you are! And you can't even accept it! Real classy, huh? She then proceeded to engage in a fiery argument, graciously ordering Chef Ramsay to vacate the premises, but not before she called him this. You're a disgrace in this industry! You would get out of my restaurant! I mean, what do I even say here? Chef Ramsay was right. She needed therapy, and I'm saying that with the utmost respect and concern. Meanwhile, Rico, who was the only voice of reason, rushed to intervene, pleading with Chef Ramsay not to abandon Chef. I've had failure in my life, but one thing I'm not in is denial, and when I do make a mistake, I admit it. Well, it was a do-or-die situation. But hey, did you see Chef Ramsay's reaction? When Abby accused him of being a disgrace to the industry, not once did he boast about his achievements or his 17 Michelin stars. I mean, we're talking about the alpha and omega of the culinary world. But even with that being the case, he decided to take the high road openly acknowledging his failures while also emphasizing the importance of acknowledging them. So what happened next? Did Abby change her ways? Well, don't let me spoil the episode for you. But keep an eye on your sub boxes because we'll definitely check in with Abby again. However, I'll say this though. Rico was indeed an amazing friend and I wonder if Abby deserved him. He had a lot at stake, including his day job, and yet, he was patient and calm and open-minded during the entire ordeal. How often do you find friends like that, huh? Anyway, moving on, so how many of you remember the mixing bowl from season 1? Nestled in Belmore, New York, the restaurant found itself in dire straits when it came on the Kitchen Nightmares radar. I'm so stubborn about keeping it alive, but am I hurting myself? Am I hurting my family? Well, that's Billy, and I found him to be so wholesome. He and his wife Lisa Galetti owned the establishment, and it was grappling with a significant surge in local competition that had cropped up over the decades since its inception. However, as Chef Ramsay soon uncovered the troubles plaguing the mixing bowl, it extended beyond the encroaching competition. And trust me, there was a lot on the line. I can't sacrifice myself and our children for the mixing bowl anymore. Enter Mike, the so-called manager, who appeared to have the restaurant's customers convinced that he was the owner. Everyone just knows he's Mixing Ball Mike. Yeah, so he had an uncanny knack for striking up endless conversations with patrons. He was more interested in chatting up and gossiping than actually helping the business. This guy is just f***ing using this restaurant to feed his ego. Right from the moment Chef Ramsay laid his eyes on Mike, it was evident that he was harboring a deep-seated disgust for the guy. The episode painted Mike as a bit of a weasel, seemingly defined by his manager's status. Like, that was his entire personality, and believe me, I cringe so hard at him, but especially here. People come in here, and they think I'm the owner, they call me like the mayor of Belmore. Come on, get over yourself. You see, Mike proudly touted their commitment to serving healthy food, but as Chef Ramsay sampled the dishes, Mike just kept hovering over the guy, prompting Ramsay to finally put his foot down. I feel really uncomfortable. No problem. You know, I got this cockroach on your back, you're trying to shake off the line to just sit and enjoy my life. That didn't stop him from critiquing the food though, since he said the crab cakes were lacking freshness but still passable, the zucchini was bland, and the salmon was over seasoned. To make matters even worse, Mike was siphoning off half of the tips, asserting that his behavior justified customers tipping generously. People know me the best because I make it a point of making friends with the customers, and that's what customers want. They want to feel special. This reminds me of Sammy from Amy's Baking Crappany, I mean company. And if you're in the mood for shocking revelations about that crazy duo, you should watch this. But this is where Mike crossed the line. During the dinner service, Mike distributed half-off coupons, shockingly admitting that they'd been doing this for eight years. Now, let's pause for a sec. How on earth could a restaurant turn a profit while offering 50% off the sticker price? Well, spoiler alert, you can't. 50, no, no, 50. In here. Yeah. Holy smoke. So, in a bid to unravel the promotional mayhem, Chef Ramsay asked Mike to provide a rundown of all the restaurant's promotions. Mike complied, lugging in a slew of costly signage that, according to him, had failed to make an impact. Later on, on relaunch night, he had a full-blown meltdown over a reservation blunder. I was told 7 o'clock this morning, not my fault! Dragons on the paper! The owners were naturally shocked at his disrespect, and Chef Ramsay had to tell him off. Hey, yes, you f*** off outside, now. In a separate conversation with both Lisa and Billy, Chef Ramsay didn't mince his words. Mike was just too much to handle. The duo needed to rein him in or cut ties altogether. The famous chef even floated the idea of shutting down the restaurant that very night. While Billy was hesitant to throw in the towel, Lisa seemed ready to walk away. 
but someone seemed too happy. If you're carrying the weight that this guy and his wife has on their shoulders, you wouldn't fucking smirk. So did she walk away for good? Or did Chef Ramsay manage to save the business? But anyway, let's move on. Up next, the famous chef made his way to Luigi's D'Italia in Anaheim, California, a restaurant that had seen its fair share of family feuds and financial fumbles. So let me start with giving you some background. Luigi Catazzone, the restaurant's founder, established Luigi's in 1981 with crucial financial support from his father Dominic. For many years the restaurant thrived, but the harmony began to unravel when Dominic retired to Italy in 1999. Soon after, Luigi's brother Tony stepped in to assist with the restaurant's operations. As differing viewpoints between Tony and Luigi escalated, it wasn't just their culinary creations that were heating up. The discord was laid bare for the staff and customers to witness, as Luigi and his wife Grace couldn't resist getting into shouting matches with Tony, who seemed to sport a laid-back attitude. The family trio's constant clashes were not only taking a toll on the business, but also fracturing their familial bonds. In a desperate financial predicament, with debts ballooning to a staggering 1.5 million, Luigi's was teetering on the brink of closure. And the tension was spilling over to the customers' tables. Chef Ramsay decided to take a peek at their website, only to discover a bizarre claim. The restaurant boasted a 22-year-old head chef. Turns out, it was Luigi, who was, in reality, 51 years old. Confused? Well, here's what happened. The claim was from 1981, and the most recent review dated back to 1991. Yeah, just a little bit out of date. Which is why Chef Ramsay wasted no time in getting to the heart of the matter. He demanded to meet the family behind this culinary drama. So there was Grace, Dominica, Luigi's daughter, Tony, and Tony's wife, Linda. During the discussion, Tony revealed that he managed the restaurant from Monday to Wednesday, while Luigi took the reins from Thursday to Sunday. Wondering why? I think you'll be amazed by this. The reason was because the two couldn't bear being in the same room as each other, and the famous chef was going to get roped into the drama. Luigi and Grace were quick to criticize Tony and Linda, branding them as lazy and indifferent to the restaurant's fate. The mere mention of these issues ignited a furious shouting match among the four adults, with emotions running high. Say that to That's what he said. No, I didn't say This is what happened. Chef Ramsay then decided to try the food, only to be greeted by a menu of epic proportions, boasting a staggering 126 items. Clearly, Luigi was lost in the sauce. Or, uh, recipes? I don't know. Anyway, Chef Ramsay confronted Luigi and Tony in the kitchen, but Luigi's defensive stance left Chef Ramsay frustrated. The kitchen's atmosphere was as heated as the dishes being prepared, with Luigi berating his staff in full view of the diners. You're an arrogant chef just like me, worse than me. Chef Ramsay tried to reason with Luigi, but his reluctance to listen led to a fiery confrontation. That's when Luigi stormed out, leaving Tony to play peacemaker and coax him back to the kitchen. The guy is what he is, and he's. English bastard is what he is, alright? Ah, <sighs> the drama never gets old. Returning to the dining area, Chef Ramsay pointed out the restaurant's claim of having the best Italian food west of Italy. He made it abundantly clear that they were in denial and needed to work smarter, not harder. The way you perform tonight, that is the man that's in control of his kitchen. The next day, Chef Ramsay called a staff meeting a first for the restaurant. The family watched from the shadows as the staff candidly discussed the ongoing conflict between the two couples, revealing how it had driven customers away. First of all, they're embarrassing for our customers, and second of all, they're not professional. The spotlight then turned to Grace, identified as the primary source of disruption and fear among the staff. Her initial resistance crumbled as she felt cornered and misunderstood, even expressing her desire to exit the business. Jeff Ramsey then stepped in, attempting to break the emotional barriers, reminding Grace that it wasn't personal. They were a team, and her team was there to support her. They are here for you. No, they yes, came they... to me! No. The emotional catharsis was pretty intense and very much needed. Sometimes, I think Jeff Ramsey cooks as a hobby. He's actually a family therapist, don't you think? We cannot start to fix this restaurant unless we fix each other first. That's a goldmine of wisdom. Next up, Chef Ramsay takes a trip to Blackberries in Plainfield, New Jersey, a soul food restaurant with an owner who, well, seemed to have no soul. Let's go, it's over. Shelly Winters, a formerly successful caterer, had her mother invest her retirement funds to set up this venture. While Mama Mary was a kind, gentle soul, Shelly was the patron saint of narcissists. I am the owner of this business. I'm just not taking any shit from anyone. No kidding. She seemed to be wearing some rose-tinted glasses because she firmly believed that the decor was fabulous, the food was top-notch, and the location was spot-on. 
But here's the twist. Her customers and staff couldn't disagree more. According to them, she was a control freak who was in denial. And trust me, that's a horrible combination. This restaurant was riddled with issues. The kitchen was a war zone with a communication breakdown, the staff was chaotic, and a staggering debt of $200,000 loomed over the place like a dark cloud. Things, however, took a nauseating turn when Chef Ramsay sampled the chitlins. The famous chef quickly requested a prayer before taking a bite of the food, but the god sent him rushing to the bathroom. I need the toilet, excuse me. I knew they'd come out quicker than they went in. Chef Ramsay made it clear just how many ways they'd butchered the lunch service. But what of Our Lady of Perpetual Delusion? Well, this is what she thought. Absolutely do not believe that there's that much wrong with my food. Returning for dinner, the famous chef was greeted by an uninvited guest. Oh, what is that? Bloody hell. Yeah, so that was a real mouse laying dead right at the foot of the restaurant's front door. The staff was in utter disbelief since they'd supposedly called in the exterminator just a week before. James, the general manager, in an astonishing twist, accused Chef Ramsay of bringing the mouse along with them. Wild. Yeah, he really went there, even suggesting that the famous chef planted it for TV drama. I, I wish you would talk a little bit of sense. The TV, put your money where your mouth is. But of course he didn't do it, so he gathered the staff to uncover the truth. However, Shelley immediately backed James's wild mouse theories, which sent Chef Ramsay to the brink of walking away. You can take your restaurant and stick it. I'm gone. I'm out of it. But Mary, the only voice of reason at this restaurant, stepped in, urging Shelley to simmer down and pled with Chef Ramsay to stay. Please don't leave. Yeah, no, I'm out of here. I'll be honest here, that poor woman deserves so much better than whatever Shelley put her through. I mean, just look at her. I, I don't understand what's happening today. Honest to God, I don't. Her heartfelt plea, coupled with a somewhat reluctant apology from James, eventually convinced Chef Ramsay to stick around. During the dinner service, the famous chef observed Shelly's disruptive presence in the kitchen as she struggled to communicate effectively, leading to bickering amongst the staff and excessively long food wait times. I have the recipes. I'm the exact. The next day, Chef Ramsay called the staff meeting, and that's when the floodgates opened. Staff members expressed their frustrations, all pointing their fingers at Shelly for being an overbearing control freak who left little room for them to do their jobs effectively. It's either her way or the highway. You take somebody out of what they're supposed to be doing and make them do something else. Shelly obviously took offense and tried to silence Dwayne, ultimately asking him to leave. Seriously, I've never seen anyone act as spoiled as Shelly. Good night. I don't have Thank a problem you so with much that. Because the honesty hurts. Things got so intense that the famous chef had to step in before it escalated any further. However, Shelly fell back into her old habits, meddling with cooking stations and causing chaos. When confronted, she stormed out, leaving the rest of the team to rally together and take charge. Shelly, now you walk away. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. As the night drew to a close, Shelly retreated to her office and refused to join the meeting. Mary made another valiant attempt to coax her out, but Shelly remained resolute. There's no point in making herself look any more stupid. Anyway, the famous chef proceeded to commend the staff's efforts and attempted one last time to engage Shelly in a conversation. However, she declined yet again. This time, Mary's patience reached its limit and she expressed her disappointment and shame towards her daughter's stubbornness. If you are done, close the damn place down. But did any of it matter to Shelly? Of course not. Narcissists, right? Anyway, speaking of intense moments, the next restaurant on my list is Finn McCool's in West Hampton, owned by Andrew Mazio, whom we lovingly call Buddy. Now, Finn McCool's thrived during the summer months thanks to the tourist influx in the Hamptons. But come winter, things got a bit lonely because West Hampton Beach had fewer residents than a cozy family dinner, just under 2,000 folks. You know, we're probably, I would say, $5,000 a week or $4,000 a week under what we need to survive. Well, that's Buddy, a retired policeman who opened up Finn McCool's in 2006 right after hanging up his cop boots. He brought the whole family into the restaurant biz. His son Brian was the head chef, and another son Jason clocked in hours there too. Jason's wife Melissa joined the fun as a server. So let's review the food. The salmon was practically swimming in balsamic vinegar, and the shepherd's pie? More grease than pie. Does pie have any balsamic vinegar? No. Good. Lovely. And Chef Ramsay's stomach definitely wasn't up for it. <coughs> oh no. It made him sick. Uh, yeah, not a great start. Returning from his quick visit to the toilet, he confronted Brian and told him that his food sucked. Well, not in those words exactly. 
He was actually quite polite, I mean by Chef Ramsay's standards anyway, and basically advised him to give his best shot every day. But that didn't sit well with Brian. He has no idea what he's talking about, so whatever he has to tell me, I don't really care. What's more, the restaurant also lacked cleanliness and organization. Canned artichokes. This is lethal. But wait, it gets even better, or should I say worse. Chef Ramsay then ordered everyone to clean the kitchen, himself included, but not everyone was on board. I don't cook in that kitchen, so I don't want to go into his kitchen and clean it. Oh, and a memorable incident involves Francis, the sous chef, dropping a chicken wing on the floor and then doing this. Yeah, so he dropped the chicken wing on the floor and casually tossed it into the fryer, claiming that the hot oil would sterilize it. While technically accurate, it's not exactly the kind of kitchen hygiene that earns a gold star. I will never forget this moment when Buddy Soul left his body. He dropped the wing on the floor, picked up, stuck it back in the fryer again. You see, Chef Ramsay wanted to mentor Brian on how to cook a proper shepherd's pie, but he thought he knew better. To have him come to your place and show you what you should be doing the right way. Yeah, why not? Would you like your own show as well? Anyway, it was clear. He had been taking advantage of his father his entire life, and when Buddy asked him to take the job seriously, he threw a tantrum. And the next thing you know, he just stormed off. I'm done working here. There are people who would have killed to get coached by Chef Ramsay himself. It's funny how this guy thought he was above it. I have a big problem with Gordon hanging over me watching every step. In season 3, Chef Ramsay visited Casa Roma in Lancaster, California. Opened in 1958, this restaurant was the oldest in town. At the time of filming this episode, the restaurant was owned by Nyla and her son Jeremy. Nyla was looking for some business opportunities, so she bought the failing restaurant in hopes of making it successful once again. However, since neither of them had any experience in the restaurant industry, they barely made a profit. While the bar used to be packed on most days, the dining room, which was their main source of income, remained empty. Since business was so inconsistent, there were days that the restaurant made $175 a day, and then there were days where they made as little as $9. Either way, running a restaurant with an average of $100 a day is impossible. And this led to a lot of conflict within the management. What's more, in just two and a half years of owning the restaurant, they'd almost gone through 20 different chefs. Some left due to a loss of pay, while others just had some differing opinions. At the time of Chef Ramsay's visit, chefs Drew and Eric were assigned with handling the kitchen. And according to the staff, Eric was the main reason behind the business's failure. Eric was so selfish that he never bothered to send the food out on time. And it's not even like he cooked up some delicious food. For the most part, his food was disgusting. On the other hand, Drew had a genuine passion for cooking. But because Eric expected him to do everything in the kitchen, it led to a lot of conflict and this affected Drew's productivity. Fast forward to when Chef Ramsay ordered the food, as usual, he had to wait extremely long. Not because the chefs were getting his food ready to perfection, but because Eric was busy taking a smoke break. Imagine having to sit through a whole hour waiting for your first order, only for the next one to take another 75 minutes. It's absolutely unacceptable to keep any customer waiting for that long. But it's even worse that Eric kept a Michelin star chef waiting for an eternity only to be served putrid food. Of course Chef Ramsay was pissed. When he criticized Eric for his disastrous service, the man simply got defensive. It was a bad day, pal. Now you're bad pushing day. enough. I get it. We understand. Eric showed absolutely no respect towards the famous chef. The way he talked, argued, and how he just didn't care showed how much of a trashy person Eric was. What the big problem is with you, Eric, you've accepted it. In your opinion only. There's nothing edible. During the dinner service, Eric was so disinterested that he didn't even communicate with Drew. If Drew asked any questions, Eric just ignored him. As the service progressed, food was sent back to the kitchen for being undercooked, frozen, and just tasting bad. But Eric simply didn't care about it. He was also too lazy to even taste his food. When food comes back like that, the shrimps, you never taste it? Well, you know, what can you do? And because he didn't get along with Drew and was sluggish as hell, the diners were left waiting for a whopping two hours. On top of that, the owners were clueless. Seeing the pile of orders and the ever-increasing wait times, Chef Ramsay had enough of them and closed the restaurant down. After the service, Chef Ramsay had a one-on-one -on -one with Nyla and told her about the biggest problem. Darling, he's not in the slightest bit interested in fucking in work and he's here for one thing and one thing only, hey, money. Jane. Ramsay was clear about one thing. If Nyla even wanted a slim chance at success, she needed to get rid of Eric first. Nyla, at first, was a little uncertain if this would be the best decision for her restaurant. But then Chef Ramsay reminded her of Drew. 
Then finally, Nyla did what she should have done a long time ago. The whole thing's just not gonna work. Okay, you, so what do you wanna do? We're gonna part ways. Okay, no problem. But this next restaurant had a committed owner and a chef who was just the opposite. In season two, Chef Ramsay visited Sante La Brea in Los Angeles, California. The establishment was a healthy food restaurant that also had some vegan options. Sante La Brea, at the time of filming, had been in business for 10 years and was run by owners Dean Hamui and his sons Arthur and Sammy. Even though the restaurant was in the heart of the city, they were $200,000 in debt and Dean was close to losing his house. Dean did everything including the cooking and cleaning, despite having a manager. Mark, the manager, and Aurelio, the head chef, were good for nothing. In fact, Mark had no clear role. Though he was hired to manage, all he really did was whatever he wanted. He was more concerned about how the restaurant looked and apparently had spent $5,000 on something as meaningless as a liquor display. Now, I say this because the restaurant was already running at a huge loss. There were definitely better things that they could have put their money into that could have actually helped the business. On the day of Chef Ramsay's arrival, Aurelio didn't show up and this clearly showed how much he cared. When Dean, the owner, tried to reach out to him, there was no answer. So, with Aurelio being a no-show, Dean was in a huge dilemma. But the show had to go on, right? This is incredibly predictable, but whatever Chef Ramsay ordered was appallingly bad. The first dish, a turkey melt, was so dry and disgusting that he fed it to the dog who was sitting with his owner at the next table. And the last dish, blackened salmon, was too dry and tasted way too fishy. So, after giving feedback to Dean about the awful food, Chef Ramsay went to the kitchen to inspect things since he was suspicious about the salmon. Chef Ramsay's suspicions were right since he found a major health code violation. One of the worst mistakes was that Dean wanted to keep Aurelio after he showed up hours late. Sammy and Arthur were very angry with Aurelio about everything. Not only did he lack promptness, but he kept the kitchen disgusting and a mess. However, Aurelio was very casual about it. What made the sons even angrier was that Dean still wanted Aurelio around despite that. He knew how this jerk worked and what he did during Chef Ramsay's visit. And that weakness led to Aurelio taking advantage of the situation. During the dinner service, when Chef Ramsay confronted Aurelio about the poor condition of the refrigerator, Aurelio's answer left Chef Ramsay in dismay. Did you see the fridge? Yeah. Anything to say or? I'm just cooking. The worst part is, Dean placed the blame on himself even though it was Aurelio's mistake. It's no wonder Mark and Aurelio took advantage of him. Needless to say, the dinner service was horrible. None of the customers liked their food and most of it was sent back. All Dean needed to do was find his voice and Chef Ramsay helped him find it. But this next restaurant used the only meat that should never go in a quesadilla. And guess what? They claimed it was their specialty. In season 6, Chef Ramsay visited Mill Street Bistro in Norwalk, Ohio. This bistro was owned by Joe Nagy after he lost his job in food sales. Joe bought a livestock ranch and later opened the bistro thinking that it would complement the ranch. The biggest problem about the bistro was Joe himself. He was rude, pretentious, disrespectful, and a liar. The bistro, according to him, was fine dining but it was nowhere close to that. Joe also claimed that the food was fresh and farmed to table, but that was all a lie. It was mostly frozen. Joe only liked to brag about his farm, and as a boss, he wasn't exactly what an employee would want. He was rude to his staff and disrespectful. Is there enough bread for dinner right now, or yeah. do you want me to do that part of the thinking too? The way you treat me is disrespectful, crude. Then you need to find another place to work. He ran the restaurant like a dictatorship, and on top of that, he was rude to customers. The meeting with Joe started off on a good note, but little did Chef Ramsay know how bad it would get. Well, the good start was mostly Joe bragging about himself. I am self-taught by old school Europeans, master chefs that had a liking to me. Lying to Chef Ramsay about fresh food is something that Joe should have never done. Because the moment Chef Ramsay would start tasting the dishes, he would know anyway. Whatever feedback Chef Ramsay gave to Joe, he didn't like one ounce of it. Whenever the famous chef said something about the food, Joe became defensive and argued with Ramsay. Well, we're not dousing the plate in oil. I'm not here to argue. I'm just telling you. Yeah, I can make you another one of these if you want to just keep on moving. One of the things that Joe hated the most was when Chef Ramsay handed him the micro carrots that he used as a garnish. He found it extremely insulting, especially since Chef Ramsay handed it right back to him. The owner hated knowing that Chef Ramsay was going to go to another restaurant to get something good to eat. What else could the poor man do? 
He was starving and not one dish was palatable. When the famous chef returned to give his feedback, Joe revealed his arrogance. When Chef Ramsay asked Joe to give him some insight about his lunch, Joe was downright condescending. I've never had anybody critique my items that told me every one of them was a piece of sh**. Chef Ramsay, however, made it a point to give his feedback, and this didn't sit very well with Joe. What was really funny was that when Chef Ramsay told Joe that he wasn't a chef and to stop pretending that he was one, Joe denied that he said he ever was. So when Chef Ramsay asked him to reconfirm who the chef really was, Joe asserted that he was. I'm not a certified chef, but who cooks? I do. Right, so you're the head chef. Correct. Make up your mind, man. The worst mistake was that Joe wasn't taking criticism and failed to see what was actually wrong. You don't even listen to your customers, let alone your staff. You have a gifted young group of servers that told me more problems and issues in the first 20 minutes of meeting them than you have done all f***ing day. When Chef Ramsay told Joe to impress him with the dinner service, Joe became defensive yet again. Joe then told Chef Ramsay that the elk he found chewy was loved by his customers. By the way, who the hell puts an elk in a quesadilla? Chef Ramsay was stunned. However, Joe ignored Ramsay's advice and continued to be in denial. 35 dollars for entrees that are inedible have a look at yourself man people seem to enjoy it Bull it's funny how joe after all that called chef ramsay his twin the staff didn't want to tell joe the truth because he was really rude to them all the time and yeah there was even a quiet sign in the kitchen which is completely ridiculous if there's pin drop silence in the kitchen then how is anyone supposed to communicate Anyway, when the customers started sending food back to the kitchen, Joe, as usual, wasn't in the mood to accept that his food was awful. It's safe to say that this man was the king of denial. With that, let's head on to this next restaurant that used the most expensive meat, but did they know how to cook it? Featured across two seasons, seasons 5 and 6, Chef Ramsay visited Burger Kitchen in Los Angeles, California. At the time of filming, the restaurant had been open for 16 months and was owned by Alan Saffron. Alan always enjoyed eating meat, and his love for meat drove him to open a hamburger restaurant where he could cook with Wagyu beef. However, there was a serious problem with his family. Alan and his wife Jen didn't treat their son Daniel as an adult and disrespected his girlfriend Wendy. Alan also stole some money from Daniel. Basically, when Alan opened the restaurant, he didn't have enough money to open it. So what he did was take money from Daniel's inheritance, something that Daniel's grandfather had left behind for him. Alan didn't even see Daniel as his business partner, and whatever important decisions that were made, Alan did it without Daniel. It's not even like he ran the show very well all by himself. Alan had hired and fired over 20 servers and 20 chefs, as well as changed the menu 10 times in under 2 years of being open. Alan and his wife believed that the staff were the main problem. They also thought that the social platform Yelp was conspiring against them by deleting all the 5 star reviews and only leaving the negative ones. Now that's a really deluded idea. To make things even worse, David, their head chef, didn't get along with Alan and Jen. But more so with Jen. David, yes, you need to listen to me. It's hard to be belittled every day, so for me to come to work now is like almost unbearable. In the end, all the food that Chef Ramsay had ordered turned out to be frozen. And the Wagyu beef that Alan bragged about was nothing like the original. But Chef David wasn't even allowed to make any changes. He had to follow all the recipes that he had been given, and he wasn't even paid his wages. However, Alan and Jen were in denial. Did you add wine to the mushroom recipe? That's how you make sauteed mushrooms. I just asked a question. Did you add yeah. wine? Yes, ma'am. As for his paychecks, according to Alan, David didn't work enough to earn one. However, that was far from the truth. David often bought groceries for the restaurant, which he didn't even get paid back for. But hearing about not getting paid left Jen agitated. Where's my paycheck? Honey, you're missing the point. Chef Ramsay then challenged David to cook him a burger, which he called a redemption burger. Alan, uninvited, joined the challenge as well and cooked his frozen Wagyu patty burger. When Chef Ramsay came back to taste David's burger, he noticed something really interesting about the patty that Alan had made. But what Chef Ramsay thought about it was really funny. I know if you're easy lunch, don't worry. No, Please. I just made a burger. My ingredients. Your own ingredients? Yes. When it came down to tasting the dishes, Alan's burger was hideous. As for David's burger, Chef Ramsay loved the presentation, and this is what he thought about it. I mean, that's what I call a burger. Delicious. Thank you, Chef. Alan and Jen didn't seem to like that David was at the receiving end of all the praise. So, when Chef Ramsay offered Jen to taste the burger, she had the worst reaction yet. <coughs> 
It was surprising that Alan thought his Wagyu meat was better when this is what the truth looks like. Doesn't the word Wagyu sounds glamorous and expensive? It doesn't mean you say it's going to deliver you the most tastiest burger. And when you deliberately choose to live under a rock, unwilling to accept change, there's no one, not even Chef Ramsay, who can help you out of it. But this next restaurant couldn't decide on what they wanted to serve. American? Indian? Indo-American? A little bit of everything? How is that supposed to work? In season 1, Chef Ramsay visited Dillian's in New York, New York. The restaurant owner Mohammed started the restaurant business in order to make a new life for his family. Mohammed employed three different managers, general manager Martin, operations manager Andrew, and floor manager Khan. Dillian's was going through an identity crisis since they served a number of different cuisines. The restaurant was struggling and was losing more than $20,000 every month. The general manager Martin described the restaurant as an American-Irish restaurant with an Indianness to it. The Indian chefs had so much difficulty cooking the American dishes that the operations manager Andrew had to step in and cook them. The restaurant was already disgusting, but with flies flying all over the place, it made things even worse. One of the worst mistakes that the restaurant made was when they served Chef Ramsay a vegetarian platter with meat in it. Chef Ramsay was appalled. Everyone's got meat in there. It's not vegetarian. It tastes like lamb. The next mistake they made was serving Chef Ramsay curry with a rotten tomato as a garnish. And the meat that was in the curry wasn't even beef. To make things even worse, when Chef Ramsay went inside the kitchen to give some feedback about his lunch, he learned something really awful. Apparently, the lamb Ramsay was served might have been old. But the chef didn't really seem to be sure about it. There were flies buzzing all around, and there was a huge tub of cooked chicken that was left on the floor. That's totally unhygienic and incredibly dangerous. The manager, who was supposed to look after all these problems, was nowhere to be found. Hello, madam. Floor manager, operations manager, general manager, anybody? During the dinner service, the customers struggled with what to order since there was a variety of Indian and American dishes all mixed up. One hour into the service, and no food was sent out. The food was already disgusting, but the customers had to even battle with the flies. Martin was the useless one of the lot, and Chef Ramsay was annoyed with him, so he gave him a piece of his mind. You've got members of your team standing here getting paid, doing all. Cool. I've never met a general manager so as you. The next day, when Chef Ramsay came to inspect the kitchen, he was faced with his worst nightmare. A nasty kitchen. There was rotten meat and vegetables, thousands of cockroaches, rat traps down in the basement, and piles and piles of rat droppings. Everything that Chef Ramsay saw was worthy of getting the restaurant shut down for health code violations. And that's exactly what happened. So these were the worst mistakes to have ever been made on Kitchen Nightmares. Of course, there are loads more out there, and I'm going to cover each and every one of them right here on my channel. And since you've stuck around for this long, I'm pretty sure you enjoyed the video. So make sure to hit that like button, share the video, and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, guys!